How do stress hormones affect the brain and memory? Interview with Dr. Isabel Hunsinger. Are stress hormones harmful to your brain? Our guest, Dr. Isabel Hunsinger, is going to share how the brain is affected by stress that we acquire from everyday lives. Her goal is to provide practical tips so that you can manage your stress and prevent the harmful effect on your brain. Would you like to learn those simple tips so that you can apply easily in your life? Then stay tuned. You're watching Happy and Healthy Mind with Dr. Rosina, episode 92, where our guest is talking about effects of hormones on the brain. Dr. Isabel Hunsinger is a functional medicine doctor born in Washington, D.C., but decided in 2000 with her chef husband and two young daughters decided to move to New Zealand. And we'll kind of hear a little bit when she tells her story. And they initially thought, okay, let's see how this different culture of the world feels. And then they had never been there and even knew where it was. And after first 20 years of being in, being in the medicine field, the last 15 years, she has been studying functional medicine, which focuses on root causes of diseases and its treatment. And so let's learn from her. And I'm your host, Dr. Rosina Lakani. I help compassionate high achievers achieve even more without burnout and without quitting their career. I'm a keynote speaker, corporate consultant, and integrative psychiatrist. I believe that your mind is the software that runs the hardware of your brain and your body. Therefore, I share practical tips for your mental fitness over here. If you need specific medical advice, please consult your healthcare professional. But if you find this content helpful, then join a mission of eradicating preventable suffering by liking, subscribing, and sharing so more people can live and perform at their best with hope, health, and happiness. If you're joining us live, please share in the chat any questions you may have. So let's learn from our Yes, So welcome, Dr. Isabel. Thank you for your time today. Hello, Rosina. Please call me Isabel, okay? All right, I would. Oh. <laughs> uh, thank you, Isabel, for joining us today. So um, why don't we start with talking about how did this topic become important in your life? What kind of issues were going on before you started uh, using some of these tools that you're going to tell us today? Oh, that's a great question. The reason this is such a passionate topic of mine is because I hit the wall and splattered. Ah, yes, I know. You understand that feeling. Because <laughs> I had to do the same thing, right? <laughs> I know. It's kind of like, no, I have no time. I have no time. I have, oh, I guess I'm going to have to make some time to deal with this. Right. So um, you you made, you laughed and smiled, you know, in 2000. You're like, oh, my gosh. And she moved to New Zealand. Well, I started to experience burnout. I had finished, I had finished my family practice residency in 1995. Five years later, I remember one night in February in Colorado, we were living in Colorado at the time, I just was like so unhappy practicing medicine in America mm. because, I mean, you had to have insurance to get health care. And I was like, come on, I want to take care of everybody, not just people with insurance. And I remember my husband and I were having a beautiful glass of Merlot and it was snowing in the elk outside. And I go, babe, let's go someplace else for me to practice medicine. And he was, you know, he didn't even have a passport. <laughs> he was like, what do you mean leave America? I've never left America. And I go, well, you need a passport. So anyway, we ended up coming to New Zealand because essentially um, I remember skiing with the Kiwis. That's what yeah. you call an, uh, uh, a New Zealander in America and down under the Kiwis. Cause they would always go up to America to ski. Cause when it's wind, when it's summer down here, which is where I'm at right now in New Zealand, it's winter up in the uh, Northern hemisphere. And I remember skiing with them during my medical training and I love their accent and we'd be skiing <laughs> through the powder and I'd go, where are you from? And they'd go, New Zealand. I go, where is that? And they <laughs> tried to tell me and I go, one day, this is the power of, of what comes out of your mouth. I said, one day we're going to live there. So one day came and uh, we moved down here with our two daughters and we've been here since 2000. 
And in and I thought, oh, you know, it's going to be different medicine because everybody gets health care here in New Zealand. And so I was a family practice here in New Zealand. You call it a GP, you're a general practitioner. And in 2000, I started getting exposed to functional medicine. And functional medicine gets to the root cause, like the reason people are getting unwell. And how do we fix that all up? And so I started understanding more and more. And then in 2013, I just like hit the wall again. I was like, ah, we don't have a healthcare system here in New Zealand. We've got disease management, you know, and my patients aren't getting any better. And at that time, Dr. Mark Hyman, are you familiar with Dr. Mark? Yes, yes. 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 Well, he was like showing up in my world and I was like, oh my gosh, that's how I want to do medicine outside of my practice because I want to reach more people. So my husband and I talked and I said, let's start doctor on a mission to prevent and reverse disease and give people hope that you can get this done. Because a lot of people think that just having type 2 diabetes or having a heart attack or high cholesterol is like normal. It's just the part of the aging process, but that's a lie. So anyway, we started that. And at the time, Rosina, I was 53. So in 2013, I was 53. I was a mother, a wife, a doctor, and a brand new entrepreneur on social media. Like, I never learned how to do this in medical school. Did you? No, I did not. No. I, 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 I could hear myself like, you know, how I had to go through all these steps too. So, yeah. So you experience, sometimes I joke about it. Life presents to you situations that you need to learn to be able mm-hmm. to do what you want to do. So <laughs> you got the experience of feeling burnout so that you can help other people. <laughs> burnout twice. (laughs) I was like, because I love being a doctor. I love being a doctor. I want to do this until my last breath. I mean it. Whatever I can do until my last breath. So a year passed and I became more and more anxious. Uh, I was listening to that inner critic inside of me going, what are you doing? You can't do this. You have no idea what you're doing. And when I get anxious, Rosina, I don't sleep. And I slept only two hours for 17 straight nights. My husband had no idea that this was happening to me. I was actually afraid to share it with anybody. And by the end of those 17 nights, I tried to take my life twice in three days. I a medical doc, you know, me, Miss Happy, just gone down, straight down. And that's what lack of sleep can do to you. Yeah. And so you don't realize great, that, you know, this could happen to anybody, like, you know, any of us. We are all anybody, vulnerable. Anybody, anybody. And by the grace of God, because I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. Like my life, I, I try to be like Jesus here on earth. That's my spirituality. And I got super close to Jesus in, in this experience. Um, but by, I, I can laugh about it now because I'm way over on the other side. But in the moment, by the grace of God, that plan was stopped. And my husband found out about it and took me to the doctor. And the doctor took me to said, uh, you got to see the psychiatrist. And you know what? The thinking is for a medical doctor to have to see a psychiatrist. It's like, oh, oh, you have mental illness. And I remember the the psychiatrist, I loved him. He was so good. I mean, he got me back to sleep. Thank you so much. (laughs) Um, But I remember him saying, Isabel, you're going to need to be on this antidepressant for the rest of your life. And look, at that point, Rosina, I totally surrendered. I was going to do whatever I had to do, you know, to get better. And But deep down inside, my soul said, hmm, we'll see about that. And so I took the medication, and then I went on a journey with my husband to figure out all the reasons why Isabel 
tried to take her life? Why did I hit the wall and become anxious and severely depressed? And <clears throat> now I'm over on the other side. Six years it took me to figure all this stuff out. And now, so that happened in 2014. So now eight years later, I'm off the antidepressants. I've learned how to sleep. Yeah, but done safely. Hey, everybody, I want you to know, I believe in medication. There's a place for medication. It helps, okay? However, it wasn't the answer. And the things I have learned, I am so grateful I went through this experience because it has taught me so much that we don't know in medicine about brain health. Mm -hmm. And so now that's what we're real. That's what I've realized is that we don't have, it's not a mental illness issue. It's a brain health issue. And when we learn to take care of all the things that affect this beautiful three pound organ that runs our lives, when we learn to take care of that, when we've got good brain health, we're going to have good mental well-being and we can deal with the hurricanes in our life. You know, we can be like a palm tree in a hurricane where we bend, but we don't break. Beautiful. And Beautiful. Yeah. I just well, I want to share one thing was that, like you said, the medications have their role. And I always say that like in, when you're in acute phase, medication gives you that initial boost so that you can deal with the things. You can learn to deal with the things and are able to come out. So I'm, I'm really glad that you're describing that. Sometimes I use this analogy that when a kid is short, you know, small, and you want them to reach the sink to wash their hands, you give them a stool, right? So they can reach the sink, but they still have to wash the hands. Putting the stool does not take care of the hand washing. Hand washing still has to happen. The stool gives them the boost to be able to do that. Similarly, the medication gives you the boost to be able to like, you know, sleep better and then have the mental energy to think about what is causing your depression so then you can work on it and get over it. So I'm glad that you were able to make that journey. Oh, me too. And so is my husband and my two right. daughters. Yeah. So how's the life different? after the journey and we'll go into the some of the uh, techniques that helped you but how does life look different now i have such an understanding of people you know that are going through that journey in medicine mm -hmm. and you know are just given pills and said this is what you need to do for the rest of your life uh, my journey my eyes are open my heart is opened i like get it I really get what people are going through. And now you're medicine. able to sleep without the medicine. Yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh. I and mood wise, sleep. how are you doing in Great. terms of depression and anxiety? Great. Hey, you know, we all, I, life happens to me, you know, I still get sad, but I know how to talk myself through this. You know, I, I know what I need to do. I got the tools to implement. Whereas before I didn't have the tools. Mm -hmm. And you know, you and I in medical training are taught to only sleep three or four hours, you know, go, go, go. You know, you're a real champion, you're a real go getter, you're a real doctor if you don't sleep, but that's a lie. I still have the PTSD from my pager. You know, when I was in residency, they had the pager, right? And it was like buzz in the middle. So you have, uh, we used to we used to work like a 36 hours shift. So you'll do the day things and then you at night you are on duty and then you had to do the next day also. So at the night, I'm like, it was just, you'd be taking these naps in between. And, and if there's a patient, then they would page you. And so I would be like, just like ready to sleep and then the pager was go and then you wake up and say, oh, oh, we had to go to the ER and take care of this patient and you have to be alert and be present and and so that you don't make mistakes and so I can relate to this sleepless <laughs> <laughs> sleep issue but anyway so the and, life has really really improved I just want to say I still have PTSD from medical <laughs> training that's for sure I, I feel for the medical for the doctors in training right now yeah yeah. You know? 
And when, when, they, when, you know, you just have worked so hard to just get into that medical school, you're just kind of giving your heart and soul to the profession. And you, you, you even feel guilty if you take time for yourself. Like I, I used to feel guilty if I had to, you know, take a break uh, for myself. And let me not kind of drift into some of the techniques that I use to be able to get <laughs> out of that guilt feeling. But I've talked about it in my podcast and earlier about having that guilt of self-care and how I use self-dialogue journal to come out. But let me, let's kind of learn from you how you were able to come out. So you went from oh. this this place where you had completely burned out, you were about to lose not just your profession, but your life. And now you are happy and vibrant and be able to come out of the sadness whenever it comes. So can you share some tips from your journey sure. that would help our audience today? So much, but I'll just stick to hormones today. Okay. Is that all right? Yes, please. I, I, I think the hormones is really, really huge. So... I had no idea that I was going through menopause. I had no idea that I was going through menopause. And the psychiatrist didn't check my hormones, you know, to see what my estrogen levels were, what my thyroid levels were. He just gave me the medicine because that's all we're taught in our medical training is this is the magic pill. So the training I really want to do is just one is stress. There's a certain amount of stress that's good for us, right, Rosina? Yes. I mean, if we didn't have a certain amount of stress, you and I wouldn't be doctors, right? Right, right. right, <laughs> right. We call it like, you know, you stress, like EU, you stress, which is like good amount of stress that gives you enough motivation, but doesn't cause the negative effect on your mind and your body. Right. And the negative side of distress. distress. <laughs> we call it D is, distress. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Is distress increases our risk of heart disease, obesity, depression, gastrointestinal or stomach issues. How many people are on PPIs or, you know, all these medications to decrease the, the acid in our stomach? It increases our risk of asthma. It also increases our risk of cognitive decline, dementia of the Alzheimer's type. And because stress increases our cortisol, which is one of the hormones that I want to talk about. So cortisol is released from our renals. And if our cortisol levels are elevated, it shrinks. Up. So cortisol is secreted by the adrenals. And when it's increased, when when we're under stress, it uh, high levels of cortisol have been shown in the research decrease a part of our brain called the hippocampus. I didn't say hippopotamus, I said hippocampus. And the hippocampus is our memory center. And so high levels of cortisol from stress shrinks our hippocampus, our memory center, which increases our risk of having Alzheimer's because Alzheimer's is all about shrinking the memory center. Mm. So we want to learn how to take good, good control of our cortisol levels. I'm not going to teach you all that stuff today. I just want to, I guess the main message is hormones need to be checked if you're experiencing any anxiety and depression. And the hormones for women that are really key and for men, but for women is estrogen. If our estrogen levels are low, we will experience anxiety. How many women present in our late 40s and 50s with anxiety and given an antidepressant, an anti-anxiety medication? Too many. And, Too I, many. I, and I, I do know that many times adding a small dose of estrogen is one of the treatment of depression. So we do add low dose estrogen with antidepressant in people where we suspect est low estrogen is contributing to their depression. Yes, absolutely. And it really, really helps. And if, you know, we've all been sold the story that anxiety and depression is due to low, at low serotonin. And so we're given SSRIs. Well, 
I mean, what is, I don't even know how many people are on SSRIs, and we still have more anxiety and depression than the world has ever experienced. So that's not the answer. Serotonin is not the only answer. We got to look at the whole picture. And the research has shown there's 14 things that we need to look at to have good brain health and prevent anxiety and depression. I'm just going to deal with the hormones. So estrogen is really important. Estrogen has been shown to be low in women that with with uh, Alzheimer's. I don't know if you know this, but antidepressants increase our risk of dementia. And I, there's more research that needs to be that needs to um, be uh, be taken on. However, what we do know is that when we don't address the estrogen issue in women, that increases our risk of having Alzheimer's. And two thirds of the people with Alzheimer's are women. Now that's not to say all women need to be on estrogen, but that does mean that we need to look at it and look at the bigger picture. The next hormone is progesterone. I love progesterone. Bioidentical progesterone is what I recommend. Are you familiar with bioidentical progesterone? Yes. yes. Great. And that's different than synthetic progesterone. So when we say bioidentical, that's body identical. That's your natural form of progesterone. And a compound pharmacy can, can get that for you. Um, and I think in America, you can get that over the counter, right? Um, the progestin, yes. Yeah, the progestin. So progestin is great to help you sleep. And it's also, it helps you calm down. It's really good for calming. And testosterone is important, and both men and women also create testosterone. So you got to get your testosterone levels down, uh, checked. And if they're not in good range, then you might need some testosterone, bioidentical testosterone, that is. And the other hormone is DHEA. And DHEA, um, Everybody knows it as the youth hormone, but DHEA is very important. And I've, I've checked my patients and if their DHEA levels are low, I will supplement them with DHEA. And DHEA is created from the adrenals. And um, the beauty of DHEA is it gets converted into testosterone and then that testosterone gets converted into estrogen. So if you've got good levels of DHEA, you may be good with your testosterone and your estrogen. The other hormone, and a lot of people don't think of vitamin D as a hormone, but it is because it's made out of cholesterol. And so vitamin D is so important for our brain health. I, I, I wish medicine would understand that uh, we need to supplement vitamin D. And the levels that are optimal in functional medicine, we always want to be between 50 to 80 nanograms per mil. Yeah. And it's not enough to just go in the sun and get, get your vitamin D. I mean, you've got to be in the sun for 20 minutes with your shirt off, your hands up between 10 and 2. Like, who is doing that? <laughs> and especially, like, you know, um, climates like Seattle, like, you know, even if you are out like that, you may more than half of the year, you won't be able to get that sunlight. Yeah. So that's why a lot of my, my patients use the the light therapy exposure to bring that. And then most of the people in Washington, we supplement with vitamin D because it is so important. Yes, and down here in New Zealand too, we've got a high rate of, of vitamin D deficiency. I think the world is pretty low in vitamin D. I know definitely in America and down below. The next hormone is cortisol. And like I said, cortisol, if it's elevated, it'll shrink your hippocampus, decrease your memory, it'll affect you. Um, and it'll also put you in stress mode. And who needs to be in stress mode and increase your risk of heart attack, strokes? The other hormone, which we call the mother of hormones, she is like the master, is pregnenolone. And you want to get your pregnenolone levels checked. Now, doctors, medic, I don't know about you, Rosina, but I was never trained to check a pregnenolone. How about you? Me too, no. And in no. psychiatry, we were not checking the the hormone levels. We were just dealing, like, you know, you would check thyroid level and we would check vitamin D, which many insurances would not cover. So a lot of people would not get it, get it tested, even when I would order. 
but uh, we were not checking the cortisol or pregnenolone or you know the other sex tree hormones which i yeah. do now as part of the integrative psychiatry i do but- oh yeah good <laughs> yay <laughs> and then the other one you just mentioned is thyroid well you know we're trained in medical training to just t- check a tsh and if the tsh is around five you're fine well there's like six thyroid hormones that need to be checked. And even if you're not getting, even if insurance doesn't pay for it, you really should be paying for it just because it's an in, in your health and check all the, all the thyroids and TSH, you know, uh, I don't wait until somebody has a TSH of five because that's already signs of hypothyroidism. That's already your thyroid, which is a gland right here that, that controls 400 functions in your body. If your thyroid is saying I my TSH is five, you've already your thyroid isn't working. And if your thyroid isn't working, your brain isn't working. So make sure it's around two is what the latest research shows. Yeah. So that's pretty much the hormone. Hormones are huge, and I could talk forever on how to do that and what levels you want and what you can do to. But at least it kind of gives people an understanding of the range of hormones to talk to their doctors. I don't want people to kind of misunderstand that, go ahead and take the supplement of DHEA from the counter and start taking it without knowing what your levels are. Because it's the body needs balance. You know, you don't want too much of something and too little of something. And it has to be kind of this balance that you have to create for the body to work at its optimum and therefore you don't want to be doing this alone you want to have a doctor on your side who is able to check these level guide you what to do in a particular situation and especially hormone management or balancing is a kind of a specialty within itself and and so you want to uh, work with somebody who knows who knows that stuff rather than just going and starting progesterone themselves or estrogen by themselves because too much of, exactly too much of good is also not good that's right and i always test don't guess. you know test get your levels tested don't just guess oh i need this or i need that and get a yeah get a functional medicine doctor or an integrative medical doctor that gets you that understands this language and there's more and more coming i know they are yeah so we have been talking about how these stress hormones are harmful to your brain. And you described that high cortisol can shrink hypothalamus. What are some of the effects of estrogen or progesterone or other hormones that you talked about on the brain? Because I've been trained by Dr. Dale Bredesen, who wrote the book, The End of Alzheimer's, I know that low hormones increases our risk of having Alzheimer's. So yeah, you have to make sure that you check those levels and address them. So the end game, the downstream issue is dementia. So I always like working upstream to prevent, you know, my husband's got a great example um, of downstream upstream because every, we always hear it in medicine, consider a lake and the lake is polluted. Well, that lake didn't become polluted all by itself. That lake has been fed by other streams and tributaries. That's upstream. So you need to figure out what's going on upstream so you don't have a polluted lake. Yeah. Beautiful example. And like, you know, there's a lot, like most of us probably has one or two, you know, uh, examples in our families who have gone through dementia and Alzheimer's. And we see our parents or grandparents go through that and we feel really feel hurt inside. And so it owes to, uh, you know, to ourselves to take steps so that we can increase our brain's resilience to avoid getting to that state of dementia in our later lives. So this is so helpful. And I just didn't realize when you're having fun, time flies so fast. So, so we're coming to towards the end. And so can you share what's your best advice for the audience so they can wrap up all you talked about, uh, maybe in a sentence or two? Find a doctor that listens, that gets you, and have your hormones checked. And we've talked about that. That's just step number one. And 
something that I just learned this morning that I was like, I got to share this with Rosina and, the, and her people is um, in the UK based neuroscientists found out that a specific song reduces anxiety by 65%. Yeah. And, and then, uh, and it also decreases our resting heart rate, which is good to decrease our cortisol levels by 35%. And the song is called Weightless by the Moscone Union. So if you just Google Weightless song, they've got the eight minute version or the, an hour version by the Moscone Union on YouTube. That music will help decrease your cortisol levels and decrease your anxiety. Wonderful, wonderful. I am so glad that you shared the resource. <laughs> and um, if people want to learn more about what, all the things that you do, how can they reach you? At right there, there's an M missing at the end, but it's doctoronamission.com, not .co. Oh, there it is. Okay. And it's D-O-C-T-O-R on a mission.com. And I'm on Facebook and as Dr. On a Mission and also Instagram, Dr. On a Mission. Wonderful. Yeah. So if you guys want to learn more about all the cool things that Dr. Singer does and her beautiful podcast, where I had the privilege of being guest recently, <laughs> too, um, you can check it out, uh, doctorsonamission.com. And um, she's going to share some cool gifts on for our resource page, which you can access at happyandhealthymind.com. And if you're in U.S. and you would like us to send you text reminders for links of resources and reminders for the upcoming shows, you can also text the word joyful to the number 38470. We'd be happy to send you the links for reminders and resources. And so let's end today's session with this message. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. What small change, what 1% change you are going to make today to improve the rest of your life? Pick one, stick with it, start applying it. And so you can be the best version of yourself. You can prevent stress and burnout and avoid all these illnesses. Thank you, Dr. Hansinger, for joining us today. Stay safe and happy. Till next time, Dr. Rosina.